great. So people are showing up. That's great. Um, hello, my name is Andy Simon. This is Award 5 NPA for January. Um, uh, I'm going to be moderating the first part of the meeting um, until we get to the candidate forum. So, and then Nate Lantieri is going to take over. Um, I want to just run through our um, brief um, introductory uh, slides for those of you that might not be. Oh, I have to go somewhere else here. Hold on. Do you want me to uh, share them, Andy? I, I can get them. I'm getting, I'm feeling proud of myself from being able to do it. So I'm going to let, I'm going to, I can get there. Hmm. That's not where I am now. Let's try again. Um, there. So here we are, Ward 5 NPA. Um, this, I just want to point out that this logo was designed by Amy Radcliffe from Gotham City Dra Graphics in Ward 5. Um, and uh, we're, uh, we're very pleased with her work. So if you have any, any uh, graphic, graphic design to do, contact Gotham City Graphics. Um, here are our guiding principles. We provide a safe space and a welcoming forum for everybody that shows up, whether uh, virtually or in person. Uh, we it, endeavor to be as accessible as we can, both um, uh, physically accessible, at least in, uh, in our various modes, and to engage with all community members um, from whatever their um, uh, perspective and to minimize barriers to participation. And uh, along with that, we uh, uh, do our best to be respectful of all uh, cultural, economic, uh, political differences, and we value diverse perspectives. And we hope that most of the time it's fun and creative as well. Um, we never endorse political candidates, um, and we uh, try to be as nonpartisan as we can in all of our activities. Here's the steering committee. Um, many of them are here tonight. Um, and uh, um, uh, that will be changing, actually. Uh, we're expecting a big turnover in the steering committee. So if you are interested, if you're listening to this, and you are interested in serving on the steering committee, uh, we will be putting out a notice very soon about availability of steering committee posts. And um, I think everybody who is currently on the steering committee would agree that it's actually a very engaging and fun way to serve the community. So um, I encourage anybody to step up and uh, join, the, join the steering committee um, over the next month or two. Formally, we have steering committee elections in um, usually in April or May, but, um, but we're going to be down to a bare bones steering committee pretty soon. So um, uh, we will accept uh, early nominations, I think. Uh, we'd, I'd like to thank Sam Heinrichs, who's there uh, on site, uh, anchoring the, the space for us at 645 Pine Street and has been doing a great job uh, as uh, CEDO liaison for the NPAs. Thank you, Sam. Um, if you're not familiar with a Zoom webinar format, uh, you can go down to the bottom and, um, or sometimes to the top, I guess, too, and uh, raise your hand. Um, you can unmute. Uh, you can start your video if you're not if you don't have video, um, and uh, that will get you oriented. If you're ever having trouble, um, speak up, and we'll try to help you get get going. <laughs> the agenda tonight: we're going to have public forum. Uh, that's uh, usually scheduled for 20 minutes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we are going to do a, a brief election of uh, the Ward 5 representative to the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Board. Then we'll have two candidate forums, uh, starting with school board and uh, then city council. And then uh, Brian Pine or someone from CETO is going to talk to us about their, their proposal for a ballot item 
of uh, downtown uh, tax increment funding to uh, do the Great Street, a Great Streets makeover of Lower Main Street. Um, uh, here's our um, uh, web page. Yeah, I added this. Right? We'll come back to this one. This is just to. Uh, okay, you added you test. added that. Okay, I snuck that in there. So didn't tell you about public, it. Public in public forum is going to open now, and here are the, our uh, brief ground rules. Please say your first and last name when you uh, when you start talking. Uh, let us know where you live, uh, Ward Five, or your street name. Um, if you have an affiliation, if you're speaking from some organization, please identify it. We're trying to limit people to five minutes max, and I, as the moderator, will let you know when four minutes um, is open. So, for public forum is open. Um, I know Bill is here to speak at public forum, and why don't you go first? Cool. Yeah. Um, thank you. I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to speak with some folks. Uh, my name is Bill Morris. I live on Scarf Avenue. Um, my family and I have been in Ward 5 for uh, eight years. Before that, uh, we were up in the New North End, um, but I've lived in Vermont most of my life. Um, and perhaps more pertinently, for the past couple of years, I've been working as uh, an elections official. Um, I think I've probably seen many of you folks at, um, at BED on Election Day. Uh, but I am here to say that I am running for the post of Inspector of Elections. Uh, this will be uh, voted on town meeting day, uh, and I would appreciate your support uh, in uh, in seeking that position. Um, and uh, I'd just say I'm running as an independent because I think it's essentially a, uh, a nonpartisan position. Uh, it's about making voting as easy, as smooth as possible. Um, but that said, I, I do have a platform. Uh, I think that um, the things that I've seen over the course of the pandemic with um, voting accessibility have been absolutely wonderful. Um, the universal mail-in ballot uh, system and the citywide drop boxes um, have absolutely increased voter turnout, and that's something that is uh, of great importance to me uh, as a you know as a citizen, seeing an engaged uh, electorate, um, and I think that um, a summary of my platform for this position is just to say I I think voting should be as broadly uh, available and as easily accessible as possible, uh, and I think from the position of inspector of elections, I'd I'd like to. Um, take the responsibilities on that uh, that can drive that forward. Um, so if you if you think uh, anything similar, if you uh, if you agree with my general sense there, I would appreciate your support on town meeting day. Um, and I think this might not be the moment for it, but I'm also happy to take any questions. Um, and my email is bill at billmorris.io uh, if you want to hit me up there. Um, but otherwise, thank you for your time. I hope I've made it in under the four to five minute range. You actually have two minutes left if you want to say anything. <laughs> no, 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 I'll I'll spare folks. I think uh, I mentioned this at a, a candidate forum earlier, but um, I, I'm fortunate in this case that Inspector of Elections has a very narrow portfolio, an important one, but a narrow portfolio. Uh, and I think I've I've already expressed how I, I you know my general sense of it. So thank you again for your time, folks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You very much. Um, um, so. so who else is here for uh, public forum? Anyone else would like to speak for public forum? Billy? Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll say something quick for public forum. Um, hi, I'm Billy Clark. I'm one of the Ward 5 and PA steering committee members. I live on Locust Terrace. Um, I forget what else I'm supposed to say. I think that's it to start off. Um, I just wanted to express my gratitude for this neighborhood and for this group in particular, just the the NPA and and you know our community as a whole. So I am currently on day sixteen of being quarantined in my house after the uh, Omicron variant has very slowly made its way through all four members of my household, um, and we are 
all relatively symptom free now. We took our first walk outside of the house today. Um, but I just wanted to say how <clears throat> nice it has been in a time where so many government institutions are falling below where we may want them to be, to have had the support of my neighbors and just everyone around to get through this really crazy stretch. Um, very much looking forward to getting the kids back into their daycare right down the street. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's been an adventure and I just wanted to express my gratitude to any and all who've, who've helped out. So, um, and just to tell everyone to try to pass that spirit along. Um, I've seen so much of that in the neighborhood and it's, it's heartening in times where we're not always finding that kind of support. So. Thank you, Billy. And I'm glad you're getting outside now. Um, uh, Carolyn. You have to unmute Carolyn. I see your hand raised. There you go. I just wanted to know how many inspector of elections we have per ward. Is it one or two or three or four? It's actually three. Um, and they're on a rotating electoral, or electoral cycle. So uh, one position is up this year. I think there will mm -hmm. be another next. Um, and there's also a ward clerk, uh, Michael Healy, who administers the entire um, system. That's also an elected position. I'm not sure when he's up for. Results. So we just uh, have one one opening now. Right. Exactly. Okay. Thank you for running. Yeah, for sure. Okay, that's it. Or right. I didn't understand this panelist thing that someone was asking for. There's wish. Okay, that's all right. You were asking about us to be a panelist or something. It's just just so you could speak, Carolyn, and show. Oh, up. okay. Thank you. Michael, did you want to add anything to that about the uh, the ward clerk or the inspector of election position? Uh, I'll only add that Bill has been an amazing part of our team, and I, I hope people will elect him so we can keep doing it for three more years. <laughs> good, good plug. Anybody else for public forum? Oh, uh, Joe, do you want to go? I'm going to raise my real hand. Sure. Okay. Um, I'm just going to comment that um, there had been some emails that we got for, as a steering committee about street lighting. Uh, there was a street lighting project that moved in through um, the addition neighborhood. I think Lyman and Richardson was the most recent spot. And um, just some thought that it got a, a lot brighter. And the Burlington Electric Commission met last week and there was a presentation about the street lighting and some discussion that followed that that might be interesting to folks. So. I'll make sure that the YouTube video link is in the minutes. But uh, if that's something that you've been keeping an eye on, those projects are going to continue to move through um, you know, various neighborhoods. They've definitely been to my block. Um, and uh, you know, I, I hope that they can push some of the light levels down personally, but we'll see, we'll see what happens as that uh, process moves forward. They're, they're kind of adjusting their um, targets. I suppose. So hopefully they'll adjust the targets. <laughs> we need Joe, a little bit of community feedback. Can I ask you a question about that? Um, sure. What what has been when you've been talking to BED? What has been the rationalization of the rationale for increasing the light level? Well, there, there is a specification. What is it? The Illuminating Engineering Society. IES specification that's being followed. Um, there's different classifications of of roads. You know, like a out on Shelburne Road would be a, a higher light level than in the middle of, say, the uh, you know the grid of a neighborhood. Um, so that's part of it. But there actually is a number for the average amount of light hitting the sidewalk and the average amount of light reflecting off of the roadway, and also the minimum of each of those that they try to sort of, you know, because there's lighting fixtures and they try to balance it out across the entire area. So um, they're trying to follow that, but the questions are, you know, maybe we could do a little bit more follow-up on, on measuring afterward um, to make sure that those modeling targets were actually hit. Because um, I think in some cases it's a little bit uneven. 
but uh, I'm putting a lot of my opinion into this. Unfortunately, I shouldn't do that. But, um, <laughs> but if you're interested in this topic, um, I'll, I'll share that and then we can potentially have um, DPW in, or sorry, Burlington Electric in, um, in the spring is what I was hearing. Might be a good time. And uh, they could present on what's coming up next and, and any, if anything has changed as far as these you know, levels. Thank you. Oh, that might have been four minutes. Sorry. No, that was that was a great explanation. Nate, did you want to say something? Sure thing. Hi, everyone. Uh, Nate Lantieri. I live on Pine Street, um, and I'm also on the steering committee. Uh, but in my life outside of this world, I work at CVOEO on their housing advocacy team. And I just wanted to plug two resources that exist for folks. Um, whether you would need to use them or uh, someone you might know. They're really great um, housing stabilization instruments that are available both for renters and for homeowners. Um, for renters, the program is called the Vermont Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Uh, it, it has some pretty flexible guidelines in terms of who is eligible for it. Um, it's really just an income-based thing, but the income levels are pretty high. Uh, and Regardless of if you owe back rent or even if you are just trying to, um, you know, kind of stay stable in this time, uh, it's able to pay for up to 12 months of your rent and your utilities as a grant. Um, so in Burlington, where housing is so expensive, this could be like a really, really significant thing, especially for, for low or low or medium income families. Um, so that, again, was called the Vermont Emergency Rental Assistance Program that's being run by the Vermont State Housing Authority. But if you'd like some assistance with an application, CVOEO, which is actually in Ward 5, it's Ward 5 nonprofit on uh, South Champlain Street, can assist you with applications in that. Um, if you are a homeowner and uh, need assistance paying for either um, mortgage or back property taxes, as well as utilities and a few other um, a few other sources too, there's another program called the Housing Assistance Program, uh, also known as HAP, or it might be Homeowners Assistance Program. Regardless, the acronym is HAP, and it's uh, being run by the Vermont Housing Finance Authority, VHFA. Um, both of them great resources. VRAP has been rolling for a little while, so the process to get into it is a little bit smoother. The Homeowner Assistance Program is a little bit newer, so there may be some kinks at this early stage, but um, relatively easy to apply for, all things considered, and it can make a really huge difference um, either in you know, your own st stability and staying in this community or someone that you might know. Um, and both of them, you can get assistance at CVOEO uh, to apply for those things. So it's just a plug. You know, they, these kinds of stabilization things might not exist in the future. It, it's, I guess, the one benefit of COVID is that there's actually funding for, for social programs. So um, I recommend all folks, if you think you might be eligible, just at least explore it. Um, there's a lot of stigma against social you know, receiving social support, but at this time it's, it's such an essential thing. Um, so use it. That's why we have them. Um, that's my plug and that's all. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Nate. Anyone else for a public forum? Please uh, make some noise or raise your hand. Well, uh, seeing no one uh, raising their hand, I think we should uh, move along to the next item on our agenda, which is the CDBG, uh, the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Board representative election. We've so far had um, two people who have expressed interest in, um, in the position. This is a, um, a position, uh, a volunteer position that, um, uh, serves on an advisory board that that distributes uh, federal money that comes in as a block grant into Burlington, divided up uh, uh, by uh, the the advisory board, um, and it's a very important job uh, with with some responsibility for um, showing up to meetings, which I assume are virtual these days, and. Um, uh, with uh, and Nancy has uh, Nancy Stetson, who's here today, has served the last two years. Thank you, Nancy, serving on that board. And last um, 
last meeting, Nancy did a little uh, uh, explanation of uh, what that entailed and, and what the benefits to you personally are, uh, which I guess is uh, not in a monetary sense, but in a uh, sense of public service and learning about how, this, how the city works and how these funds are distributed. Um, is there anyone else besides Ilona Blanchard and Nate Lantieri who've expressed an interest already who is interested in putting their name forward uh, for this uh, position? <laughs> so not seeing anyone or hearing anyone. So I, what I would like to do, we're going to do a, a little election, but I would like to do is give each uh, um, candidate a chance, just a minute or two, to uh, present yourself, uh, just give a little description of who you are and why you're interested in serving. Ilona, would you like to go first? I Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, uh, uh, sorry, I, I feel like I'm terrible at this and I, I'm, uh, so Alana Blanchard, um, I've lived in the city of South Bur of Burlington. I work for the city of South Burlington in community development. Um, I've lived in Burlington since 2012, um, and in Ward 5 since 2013, we, uh, live on South Champlain street. I have a strong interest, obviously, in community development. Um, I've actually spent CDBG funds, so I'm a little bit familiar with the program, um, but uh, especially um, I'm very supportive of the types of, um, of, of um, initiatives and projects. Um, they can be used for both capital and for community um, operations, operations of community organizations of um, uh, those types of um, supporting those types of um, outcomes. And so I was interested because I uh, have not been involved in the community um, as much since I've moved here, more just on my street and with my neighbors, but not so much on a broader um, scale. And this seemed like a good opportunity to very, uh, um, sort of start to uh, give back to the wider community in an area where I do have um, some knowledge, uh, but also would learn a lot definitely from um, about what's going on specifically in Burlington and the particular needs of the greater um, part, uh, city of Burlington and uh, be able to contribute in terms of um, helping to look through applications and um, evaluate them in terms of each other. Thank you very much. Yep. Nate, would you like to uh, uh, tell us who you are and why you're interested? Sure thing. Uh, hi, everyone. Nate Lantieri. Uh, I've been a Burlington resident since 2015. I've been in the South End since 2018. And uh, for the past few years and pretty much like my whole adult life, I've really just been so fascinated with the way that this like massive, I always think of it in this metaphor, this massive ship that is a city, what goes into uh, actually steering the wheel of like, what what is the machinery behind making this place work? Um, however, I've never really seen behind the curtain of what that what that machinery actually looks like. Um, I've kind of been tangentially getting involved in different ways, um, you know, through the past few years in, in just kind of various community development related things. Um, starting with, I studied community development in school uh, at UVM and uh, did my senior thesis on the Burlington planning system. And that was kind of my first taste of really getting involved. Um, and, and through these past few years, I've kind of been uh, trying to figure out ways to, to just get behind that curtain. Um, I keep getting back to this curtain metaphor and it's not really going anywhere. <laughs> so yeah, that's really it. I've, I've never been in a position where um, I'm actually helping make the decisions on, on how money is spent in this kind of uh, urban, urban planning world, this urban development world. Um, I've always been at the, the grantee stage. Um, so kind of getting that perspective change 
How do um, different bodies interface with the city? How does the citizen board interface with the city? Um, how does it all get wrapped up in public participation and engagement? How is it solicited? Um, you know, what nonprofits are going to be participating in this and applying for it? Um, all those things that sound so dry are just like infinitely fascinating to me. Um, so really, I'm just hoping to serve in this community to um, one, get that, <laughs> I can't leave it, peek behind the curtain, see what's going on. Um, and just to kind of continue giving back to this place that uh, I've really loved and if, you know, just kind of tried to find ways to continue to give back to it uh, because it's given me so much. So uh, if I got your support, I'd really appreciate it. And, um, you know, but it sounds like we'll be in great hands regardless of, of who ends up on this committee. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Nate. Now I'm going to um, turn it over to Joe Derry to explain how we vote. Joe, could you take that over? Are you there? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I sorry, I meant to unmute before I did the screen sharing clicking. All right. So I guess I don't have screen share on, but that's a pretty big font. Um, what we'd like to do is, I, is there anyone other than our CETO rep in the in the room in on Pine Street? I guess there we could have like a, a paper ballot is what I was thinking. Of course, I'm not there to help. Um, otherwise, I would like people to go to npa5.org, which is our website, slash vote, npa5.org slash vote. And then there's just a link there to the Google form so you can vote. And that makes it, that just seemed like the least awkward way for us to uh, administer this election. It looks like I already had one or two or three or five responses. So I guess it's working. Okay. So I'll just leave that screen share open for uh, a moment. And then I, I don't know, maybe we'll, you know, move on with the next item and circle back to this, do you think, to announce the decision? Well, let's give people a minute because I'm going to vote too, uh, okay. just to get to uh, get to that uh, site and see if anybody has any troubles with it. Um, the form. All right. Is um, is everybody finding their way there that wants to vote? You can do it over no. the. Oh, okay. No, I can't find. I can't get there. Can you give us a few more minutes, please? Absolutely, and you can continue voting um, uh, throughout the meeting. I don't think that you need to do it uh, right away. I think that would be fine. It could. Uh, we probably will should have an endpoint. Uh, so that we can announce the winner. But um, th I think you should uh, take your time getting there. And uh, and if, you know, in the course of the meeting, if you're having still having trouble, we could um, do probably stop for a minute and have a little tutorial if anybody is, needs help. Andy, I go to that site, but then there's nothing telling me where to vote. Yeah. It's just a little um, underlined link. I guess I could have made it a little bit more bright. Yeah, we're not um, understanding this. If you click January 2022 CDBG, it brings you to the form. So it doesn't look like a link, but if you just click right on that title, it'll bring you to the form. And it's just, all right. yes, all right. But then there are a whole bunch of underlines. Which ones do we click on? There are about eight click underlines on here. So I don't know which ones we do for the voting thing. Um, here, I'll, maybe I'll show you what it looks like for me, and then you can tell me why it doesn't look the same. <laughs> so this is npa5.org slash vote. And then you just got this guy. It was supposed to, the idea was to, so you wouldn't have to type in this whole um, mix of characters on the Google form. So we, you're trying to make it a little bit less typing. So is this what it looks like? You have like our little, I guess I could have gone a little smaller with this image. And then right here is a link for CD. Right, and you so click on that and then you have 18 different things you can click on. Go click on it. 
Let's see. Oh, well, you, I didn't get that. I have a whole list of... No, I didn't get that. Okay. Yeah, you know what? You could also... Here, let me just do this real time. If you want to oh, email, right. I'll email your vote to like our mail list. We could probably tackle that too, right? We can so, only vote for one person? Uh, generally, yeah. <laughs> okay. We don't have a we don't have an alternate, so yeah. I guess if it was a steering committee, you could vote for up to nine. But right. email was it? Or you bring your. I think that's right. The typing contest. Yeah, that's the right. That's the right address. So you see, I. I'm still sharing, right? I typed the, um, let me make this bigger. Let's see if I can break screen sharing. How about that? No, it's not going to work. <laughs> I found the oh, ballot. It there it is. Now it's huge. More five NPA underscore BTV at googlegroups.com. That's our email address. It's even more typing than the original thing, but probably will work for you if you're having trouble with the forms. You may have to be logged into a Google account or something kooky like that. So <laughs> maybe I just didn't experience that hurdle. So Andy, how's, I, there, how's I, everybody I'm, doing? If anyone needed that email address, um, go ahead and do it that way. Otherwise, you can use the form. And um, let's give it. A, I think we should just like go through the next agenda item and then circle back maybe one or two items and then come back to announce. Okay, let's do that. And if, if, we, uh, if we need more assistance, we'll, we'll go to that. Right, or you can just email that. If you or want you can, to, you can email you can that email it. list for, uh, for assistance to the extent we can figure out how to help you in this. It was easier when we just tore up little pieces of paper and just be like, passed them me. around. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, the next item on our agenda is um, uh, candidate forum. And um, it, it sorry, oh yeah, Joe, can you stop your screen share so we get off that? Thank you. Yep. Um, and uh, Nate, in his many roles tonight, is now gonna be the moderator of the candidate forum uh, for school board and then for city council. Thank you, Nate. Of course, and thank you all for joining us tonight at our uh, Ward 5 Candidate Forum. Uh, it should be a really interesting conversation. Get a chance to hear from a uh, school board candidate as well as some city council candidates. Uh, just as a reminder, town meeting day is on March 1st, first Tuesday of the month. I'm pretty sure it's the first this year. It is, in fact, March 1st. Um, and ballots should be coming out in mid-February. So be on the lookout for those. That's why we're doing this so early. Traditionally, the NPA candidate forum is in the uh, February meeting, but you know timelines change, so we change with them. Um, we're going to start out with our <laughs> our uh, school board forum. Um, from my understanding, there is only one announced school board candidate uh, in Ward Five, and I would say if you happen to be a school board candidate and you're on this call and you are not yet announced, now would be a great time to do so. So otherwise, we're gonna just go forward with it being one candidate um, in this forum. So without much further ado, I can introduce uh, our uh, school board candidate and that is Lucia Campriello. She'll be joining us for this forum tonight. And um, typically in these kind of settings, we would have uh, you know, a little bit of time for back and forth, but you know, because she is the only candidate, uh, it's going to be a little bit more of an abbreviated session in terms of that. So just in terms of layout, um, we're going to start with a, a four minute uh, opening statement where Lucia can kind of just run through whatever uh, she would like to. And then we have some more targeted questions that have been solicited from you all. So this is a, you know, a reminder to all folks who are joining us tonight. If you ever see a chance to get engaged, if you ever see a chance to ask a question of of your candidates, typically on Front Porch Forum, fill it out. It takes just a minute and uh, 
you know, it, it helps us out and it, and it helps kind of, uh, you know, create more of this community sense as we're going through these things. So with that, Lucia, the, the floor is, you. Oh, before that, I'm going to pause one more time because I see Andy is raising his hand. I just wanted to add that I did confirm with um, uh, Jordan Butterfield at CCTV that they are also going to have a, a candidate forum for the ward city councilor and school board uh, positions. And uh, the date hasn't been announced yet because of the, the fact that the deadline for candidacies hasn't, um, hasn't expired yet, uh, hasn't happened yet. So um, there will be at least one other opportunity, a formal uh, candidate forum to uh, listen to the candidates for the uh, two offices. Great, thanks Andy for that. And be on the lookout, we'll, you know, now that we have this as a head, uh, heads up, we'll, we'll post it on front, front porch forum once uh, the date is finalized. So now without much further ado, I'll pass it to Lucia for your opening statement. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Nate, for the warm welcome. Andy, you as well. Um, thanks so much to my friends and colleagues on um, the steering committee for hosting this conversation. And thanks to you all for choosing to spend your time um, in this way tonight. Um, as Nate and Andy said, my name is Lucia Cambriello. I have lived in Burlington South End for about six and a half years now. Um, my husband, Joe, and I moved to Burlington when our oldest daughter, Angeline, was 15 months. She's now in second grade at Champlain Elementary School. Um, and our younger daughter, Sophia, is four and a half. Um, she's finishing up her last year of pre-K at Pine Forest Children's Center, um, which is just down on Flint Avenue um, in our neighborhood as well. So um, some of you might know me from my service um, as steering committee member on this ward, uh, wards NPA, um, or as a board member at Generator, which is the makerspace over on Sears Lane, where I chair the fundraising committee. Um, and before COVID spent a lot of time in that space doing some very cool things. Um, I also serve as a board member um, with the Vermont Association for the Education of Young Children, where I participate on the finance committee. And professionally, I'm the Chief Engagement Officer at Let's Grow Kids, where I lead our organization's fundraising campaign um, to resource the work it takes to transform Vermont's zero to five childcare system. Oh dear, am I still here? Okay, yeah, great. Still here. Sorry, I just got a funny Zoom message that I had been signed out, and that is likely because we have had uh, just a rotation of book buddy sessions with grandparents all week Well. Um, we've had some outages in our child care, um, but good, glad to know I'm still here. Um, so yeah, so upon learning that Mike Fisher um, planned to step down as our ward's school board commissioner, um, I reached out to him to learn a little bit more about the role. And I have to say, um, after my first cup of coffee with him, my initial reaction was, whoa, this is an even bigger job than I realized, although I was fully prepared um, to hear him describe it as incredibly hard work and also very rewarding work. Um, he didn't totally scare me off. I was still curious. And so I began chatting with friends, neighbors, community members, um, community leaders, a handful of board members who are currently serving, um, really to learn more about the work and um, also to hear what's on the horizon um, for the district. So Mike and I kept having coffee. I continued my listening to her. And I also spent some time reflecting on what motivates me and brings me joy. And I landed on two things. Um, of course, from a very personal perspective, my own children are a big part of this equation. Um, but more broadly, my commitment to children and also to supporting vulnerable populations has been central to my career over the past two decades in a variety of ways in several sectors. Um, and secondly, I'm motivated by a challenge, um, like my current job, for example, where I'm leading this $50 million fundraising campaign um, to resource Let's Grow Kids' mission, which is to change policy and substantially increase public investment in Vermont's childcare system. This is something that no state in the country um, has achieved for its children. It's incredibly challenging work. It's motivating and it's rewarding all at once. Um, so it's really with a passion to serve a commitment to children, and being a parent of now almost two children in our public school system that I see no better time than now to raise my hand and run for Ward 5 School Board Commissioner. 
Um, so just to close, I want to thank Mike Fisher for his service over the past several years and also for his support um, throughout my campaign. Um, I'm also grateful to many neighbors who've shared their time and insights with me over the past several weeks, and I look forward to continuing to meet uh, many more of you along the way. Um, and then again, I'm grateful to you all for being here tonight and for the conversation that we'll have together. Thanks. Thank you, Lucia, right on time. Um, and if I do this, it's backwards, dang it. I'll still do it anyways, and it'll you'll you'll be able to tell. It'll of, be enough. Thanks, Nate. It'll be enough. Yeah. So it's, it's um, normal. It's normal for us. It's mirroring it on on your end. So oh, it looked normal. normal for you. Good to know. Okay, that's weird that it does that, but we'll roll with it. Um, and <laughs> button for that. Yeah. So I, I, we we have a few questions for you, Lucia. Um, that, like I said, they came in from from folks who responded to our forum that we put out. Um, so we'll go through these and you know, about three minutes on each of them, that kind of gets us right at, at the time that we're looking at. Um, so the first one for you is, what do you think are the three biggest challenges ahead for the school board? And then how will you contribute to dealing with them? It's kind of a bigger question, but we're leading off with it. Great, thank you. Um, so let's see, three challenges. Two come to mind quite readily for me, um, facing us in 2022. And the ones that I'll highlight tonight include the high school and the pandemic. Um, I'm going to start with the high school, which um, is perhaps the biggest and most immediate challenge facing not just the school district, but our entire community. Um, and that's financing the high school. So we are in the unfortunate position of having to raise revenue in a moment when taxpayers are stretched and stressed. And at the same time, we need a high school that our community can be proud of and that our students deserve, um, not just to fulfill our obligation of providing quality education to our children, but also in order to attract more families to Burlington who will contribute to our city's tax base. Um, so I really see the challenge being uh, before the district developing a plan um, that is fiscally palatable, that leverages all available funding sources, and that honors education as a cornerstone of a healthy community. Shifting gears a little bit um, as it relates to the pandemic, um, you know, as we approach the two year anniversary of the COVID-19 pandemic, I cannot help but think daily about how stretched our administrators, our teachers and our staff are, as well as of course, our families and our students. And I also think a lot about um, the external pressures that the pandemic has placed on academic achievement and its accentuation um, of disparities that existed already among our students within the district. And so I'm hopeful that um, over the course of this year that we'll find ourselves in a different position from a public health perspective um, as we move through 2022. However, I worry about how we will position ourselves as again, a district and a community to fully recover in the coming years and support the generations of student, the generation of students rather, who um, whose academic lives have been upended. All right, thank you, Lucia. And let me restart my timer. That brings us to our next question, which is, how do you plan to engage Ward Five families, both the children and their parents, in school board decision making? Ah, this is cool. Okay, great. So thanks. So. I think the place to start with this question is to reflect um, that I really think of the school board as doing two things primarily, community engagement and governance. Um, within the governance bucket, you have kind of financial oversight, support and oversight of the superintendent, um, policy development, monitoring, but ultimately community engagement and governance are entirely interdependent. Um, stakeholder participation is what informs good policy, and it's absolutely imperative. So I think um, what I would share is, let's see, there are a handful of formal ways um, in which the school board supports community engagement. Um, for example, board meetings, committee meetings, just like these NPA meetings, those are open meetings. Um, the public can participate. There is an opportunity to both contribute to the conversation as well as to listen and to learn. Those meetings are publicized on the BSD website, materials are provided, 
Um, and I would encourage folks to tune in um, if they're able. Um, and then there are community meetings like this one, like PTO meetings, other community meetings um, that I think are good opportunities for community members to access and contribute to district-wide conversations, um, opportunities to raise concerns, raise awareness, um, and, and you know, be in community with other stakeholders who share an interest um, in our district. Um, I think advisory groups are another kind of more formal mechanism um, in which community members can participate uh, in decision making. And I would cite the examples um, related to the strategic planning process that's underway right now with parent advisory groups, student advisory groups, et cetera. Um, but I also realize that the formal nature of these forums um, can also present barriers to participation. And so I see great value in leveraging our wards, um, community-based organizations that have deep connections to families within the district um, so that we can ensure that we're supporting those opportunities to participate in spaces where families and children are naturally gathering. Um, and lastly, I will say that I think some of the most rich and valuable participation comes from students themselves. So students are living in our education system every day. Their personal experiences reveal a lot about what's working, what's working well, and what's working less well. And on a personal note, I am incredibly inspired by the student activists who are right now calling upon lawmakers in Montpelier to pass policies that promote climate change and equity and anti-racism in Vermont schools. Great. Thank you, Lucia. And this is the last of our, our scheduled questions for you. Um, but at the end of it, uh, I'll also give you time just to do a one minute kind of wrap up closing statements, share your links and stuff. So um, this is kind of a combination of a few questions we put together um, around people waiting and, and funding for schools. So how will new Vermont people waiting formulas affect Burlington? And from your perspective, what needs to be done at the state level to more equitably fund our schools? Okay, so um, the first thing I want to do is acknowledge that I am not an expert uh, yet in education finance policy, and it might be a high bar to aspire to become an expert, um, but I sure will try. I am learning a ton, and I'm really eager to continue to learn. Um, so what I can offer now is really that the pupil waiting factors report of 2019, which was commissioned by the legislature and researched by um, folks at UVM and also at Rutgers, basically concluded that Vermont doesn't currently recognize the actual costs um, of educating some of its students, including those who attend smaller schools, who come from under-resourced families and households, who live in rural areas, and for whom English is... Um, either a second language or their English learner language, English language learners. Um, what it means is that school districts in Vermont, uh, like Burlington school districts that serve uh, more diverse populations are underfunded. Um, so the 2019 report made some recommendations to adjust the weights, um, to create equity within the funding formula. And more recently, a legislative task force um, made a set of different recommendations um, on the subject that are currently under review uh, with the House and Senate. Um, so, you know, again, ultimately to fulfill our obligation to all of our students, our district requires adjustments be made um, to the state's funding formula. And I think the good news in this conversation is that there is a role for all of us um, and all of you, I guess this is my CTA moment uh, for you, um, and that's to advocate for equity um, and fairness within our funding formula so that districts across the state and in Burlington have the resources they need to do their jobs. Um, and so what I mean by advocate is you can contact your legislators. Um, you can go online and look them up if you don't know readily who they are. Uh, you'll find all of their contact information um, across the House and Senate, and you can reach them directly and lend your voice to the conversation and reflect um, to them, what's important to you in um, the funding formula in, in your hometown in Burlington. All right. Thank you so much, Lucia. And yeah, you got one minute. Just kind of any closing thoughts, any links, anywhere people can get back in touch with you. It's all yours for a minute. <laughs> The link thing is hilarious because I have a Squarespace website, so it's the most complicated link of all time. Um, but I know that Scott Pavick will put it in the minutes, um, and I will read it out as well. But first, um, I just want to thank 
Um, thank you, Nate, for moderating tonight's conversation. Um, it was fun. Um, and really just that I had three goals for tonight. Um, the first was just to introduce my candidacy for Ward 5 School Board Commissioner. Um, and the second was to reflect for you some of the values that I would bring to the role. Um, and the third is to invite you to support my candidacy on March 1st with your vote. Um, so I hope that I, I think I did accomplish those goals. Um, you'll choose on March 1st. Um, and I really welcome the opportunity to continue the conversation. And so um, again, I know Scott is gonna put a whole bunch of good contact information in the notes, um, but you can find me, and this is where I really laugh, interesting decision on my part, Lucia, four spelled out F-O-R, B as in Burlington, S as in school, D as in district, dot squarespace.com. Um, but really take a look at the minutes because he'll include my phone number, which is 802-391-0079 and also my email address. Um, but please do learn more about my candidacy. Please reach me. Um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Lucia, for joining us tonight. And with that, we are going to shift our gears a little bit over to the second of our two forums, uh, this being for the Ward 5 City Council seat. Um, yeah, we have uh, two candidates that are here tonight. Uh, we have Ben Traverse and Fareed Munarcia. Um, and as a reminder, the election will be on March 1st with ballots coming out the middle of February. So be on the lookout for those. Um, and if this conversation is so inspiring to you and you want to get involved in your community, you can. The NPA is always looking for engaged folks to um, help out and join this team. It's a pretty fun and flexible body that we can do a lot of things that uh, some of the other arms of government in our city can't do. So um, that's my last pitch. Well, it might not be my last pitch, but it is a pitch. Um, and with that, I will have uh, Ben and Fareed can un, un, uh, start your video and join the screen and I will try and spotlight you guys. Let's see. So that's one spotlight and here is number two. All right. And I'll do myself as well in a moment because I'll give you time cues throughout. Um, same deal as with Lucia, four minutes for an opening statement. It can kind of be whatever you want it to be. And then we'll have a series of questions where it'll be three minutes each. And I'll give you, um, you know, I'll give you my phone on the screen at uh, one minute left in, in each of those chunks. And then at the end, one minute for a closing statement. So Great. for me, I have Bill um, pinned. You have Bill maybe, pinned. Maybe I did that. I don't know. Yeah, you might have done that. <laughs> He's a very important guy. <laughs> there I do appreciate that. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I'll bring you back in later. All right. Yeah, I guess that's just my end. Um, Too much power. So with that, let's start with our opening statements, um, and we'll just start it alphabetical. So, so Ben, why don't you start with your four-minute opening statement, and like I said, be on the lookout for my cues for time. Uh, great, um, and thanks, Nate. Uh, I guess I should start just in case my dad's watching. I should start and say that uh, my name is actually pronounced Ben Travers, not Traverse, but you guys can call me whatever you want. <laughs> uh, so thanks for everyone for coming out tonight on a cold evening uh, when so many of you are feeling this pandemic, perhaps more so now than at any point in the last couple of years. Uh, my heart goes out to the parents in particular who seem to be dealing with uh, contact tracers or, or close contacts on a daily basis. Um, I agree with Lucia here. Thanks as well to the Ward 5 NPA for hosting this forum. Uh, I think I'm the most senior now steering committee member for the Ward 5 NPA. I'm in, I'm in my fifth year. Uh, I've been on your end of organizing many of these forums. Uh, I deeply respect the work that goes into it and the work that you're doing for the community. Uh, so thank you very much. Same goes as well to our, our great representatives from CETO uh, and from Town Meeting TV. Uh, so like I said, my name is Ben Travers. Uh, I've been a resident of Burlington for most of the past decade. Uh, I work as a lawyer downtown and our family of five uh, lives on South Crest Drive in the Addition neighborhood. Uh, I just finished a couple hours ago cooking dinner for my three kids. My oldest daughter, Lola, is a first grader right down the street at Champlain Elementary. My four-year-old Jack and six-month-old, now Zoe, uh, go to preschool here in Burlington. We love this city. 
Uh, we love our neighborhood and we are invested in its future. I'm running because I believe local government plays a unique role in our day-to-day -day lives. The water from our faucets, the lights that are on in our homes, the sidewalks, bike paths, and roads we take to and from work and school, the parks we play in with our kids are all local government. I'm running with the intent to recommit our city council to these local issues, to work as a fair-minded consensus builder, and to listen to and respect all points of view. I don't enter this race with a particular ideology or political agenda. My commitment is to view every decision through the lens of whether it's making life better and easier for all my neighbors from all walks of life. I understand the importance of community. My family would not have made it through some tough times without the support of friends and neighbors. Our community in, in our neighborhoods, our schools, our workplaces, and among family and friends is what props us up and allows us to thrive. In Burlington, I'm driven to serve that community that makes this city so great. This is why a couple of years ago, I joined the Burlington Parks Commission that I'm now the chair of to be a better steward of our outdoor spaces. It's why five years ago, uh, I joined the steering committee of this neighborhood planning assembly, uh, where I've worked with my colleagues here to, uh, I hope, uh, from your perspective as neighbors, build more open and, and inclusive spaces for community dialogue. Uh, it's why a number of years ago, uh, when I was a renter in the Five Sisters, I joined the city's housing board of review uh, to um, assist tenants and landlords in resolving security deposit disputes and to uphold minimum housing standards. It's why during the pandemic, I've regularly delivered food and other essentials to neighbors throughout Burlington. I look forward to discussing the issues tonight and as the campaign moves forward, uh, such as issues related to housing, affordability, uh, how we can help our houseless neighbors, how we can ease the tax burden placed on Ward 5 neighbors in particular uh, in the wake of the recent citywide reassessment, uh, how we can help families find more affordable quality childcare, uh, how we can continue to make public safety reform in a uh, responsible manner, still founded in, in racial equity and justice, and how we can expand upon opportunities uh, to have community-driven projects in our parks. Finally, I want to say hello to my friend Fareed. Uh, congratulations, Fareed, on getting the Progressive Party endorsement. Uh, I consider you to be a friend. I, I, I hope you feel the same way about me. I've appreciated our dialogue over the years. Look forward to our discussing the issues tonight and keeping that dialogue going forward through the campaign and thereafter. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you, Ben. Um, so Fareed, it is your time for an opening statement. You have four minutes. Um, hi. Hi, my name is Fareed. I've lived in uh, Ward 5 in the Five Sisters for most of my life. I am uh, joining this race as a volunteer for an electoral campaign project uh, to bring more direct democracy to Burlington. Um, we have a set of charter change that we would like to present to uh, all the voters. Uh, and uh, we would like your support and your signature so we can um, vote as a city to incorporate some of this direct democracy mechanism into our elections um, in November. Um, I, uh, I believe that Burlington is a very unique community and I feel blessed to have been living here um, most of my life. Uh, I do know there are a lot of uh, incredible things going on in the community. Um, and although we are now facing multiple challenges with uh, the pandemic, with climate change, and all these other major uh, things uh, going on in the world, uh, as a community, we have uh, what it takes to not just survive, but also to thrive. Um, I do think uh, uh, participation is um, key and whenever there is important conversation happening uh, such as this one uh, where decisions are made where visions are discussed um, the first thing we should always do is to look around the table and see who is not there who is not present whose voices uh, are not being represented and i think we could do much better um, as a community on that front um, I'm running to 
um, promote direct democracy. Uh, Burlington is uh, an outlier in Vermont in terms of uh, voters' ability to propose uh, solutions and to make um, to to enact uh, policies um, that are popular using uh, majority rules. So um, please take some time to check out our website. There are two charter change that we want to put on the ballot for the November election. And we will be collecting as many signatures as we can on the town meeting day. Um, so please check out propositionzero.org and people for policeaccountability.com. Um, these are two uh, charter changes that we are hoping to incorporate into our city charter. Um, one is to uh, hold um, our police department um, uh, accountable to an independent body that's also accountable to us. Uh, and um, one, the other one is to um, to set up the mechanism and to grant the uh, the voters of Burlington the power to put ballot questions um, uh, during the election and to initiate um, a, a ballot measure uh, using by collecting uh, uh, enough signatures. Uh, so, propositionzero.org. Um, Place to uh, take a look, um, and uh, people for police accountability dot com. And, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, I, I do consider Ben a friend, and I'm really looking forward to uh, a new. Fareed, you froze there for a second, but I think we got you now. Um, it was just during your wrap up anyways. Yeah, no problem. And sorry for distracting you with me dropping my phone. Um, so uh, something that you mentioned kind of goes into what our first question was, is going to be, and we're not starting with a softball, folks. The future of policing and public safety is still a major question in Burlington. What do you see as the future of public safety? Do you support, the, and then these are kind of two sec secondary aspects of it. Um, you know, touch on them if you can. Do you support the CNA report and do you support an independent independent police review board? Um, so Freed, I'll start with you just for the sake of parity. Um, so um, I've heard the mayor say that he would like to be able to live in a community where the police is no longer necessary. And I, I do think most of Burlington share that sentiment. Um, unfortunately, I do think there has been a, a loss of trust um, in our law enforcement. Um, and uh, I, I believe that uh, there needs to be uh, a lot more accountability uh, mechanism in place uh, for the Department of the City. I mean, if even if Burlington uh, Police Department has perfect record, any government, uh, any part of the government that is empowered to take a life should always be uh, should always have more scrutiny and should be the, the standards of uh, behavior should be set really high uh, for any part of the government that we empower to, to not just save life, but to also take lives. So, uh, and that's with any agency. And I do think like looking at the history of the department, uh, it, is, uh, it is troubling to me to see uh, how many people have been killed um, under this administration. Um, we have, we've had more civilians uh, died behind the police uh, in the last 10 years uh, compared to like all the other previous ad administration combined. And to me, that's not acceptable. Uh, and so we got to do much, much better when it comes to holding the police accountable and how to uh, rebuild like the, the trust that's been lost between law enforcement and our community. All right. Thank you. And uh, Ben. Same question. The future of policing and public safety is still a major question in Burlington. What do you see as the future of public safety? And then as an aside, do you support the CNA report and do you support an independent police review board? Great. Uh, thanks, Nate. So in talking about policing and public safety, I think it's important for me to first acknowledge that uh, my lived experience is different than that of many of our neighbors. 
Uh, and I think when we look at policing and look at public safety, it's important that we put ourselves into the shoes of others who have very different lived experiences uh, than my own. Uh, I do not agree that, that law enforcement is, is unnecessary, but what I, I do think is that securing our public safety requires a comprehensive approach, considering all of our diverse communities um, that does not rely completely on law enforcement. I think that we've uh, put law enforcement in a position to do, to do much beyond uh, traditional police work, and we need to find ways to change that. Uh, there's no easy answers, um, but some ideas is, is continued investment in alternative public safety resources like community service officers, other mental health professionals, uh, restorative justice programs. Uh, I will say, for example, on, on the Parks Commission, uh, we played a role in the development of this new position that we'll see in the next couple of years of an urban park ranger. Uh, it'll be an education-driven position in our parks uh, under the Parks Department, not the Police Department, uh, to the end of also enforcing rules and regulations in our parks. Uh, I like the idea of alternative resources like that. Uh, you asked specifically about uh, the CNA report. Um, the city council in, in a bipartisan fashion uh, ended up voting in favor of that. If I was on the city council at the time, uh, I likely would have shared that vote. Um, but we don't have a police chief right now. Uh, and I think we need to restart the effort to hire a highly qualified police chief who will ensure that we recruit, retain, train uh, law enforcement officers dedicated uh, to our community and, and committed to eliminating bias in policing. Uh, I'd also uh, uh, agree with Free to the extent that I'd like to explore uh, how to best establish an independent body with the authority to fully investigate claims uh, regarding law enforcement. Um, and finally, if you don't mind, you know, because I think public safety, when we talk about public safety, it's a broad issue that goes beyond just policing. Um, that pub, that uh, uh, I, I just want to take the opportunity to note um, that I think we could also invest in, in innovative approaches uh, to prevent opioid overdose uh, and recommit our community uh, to saving lives lost to that other endemic in our community. Thank you, Ben. And uh, I just want to be conscious of time. It seems as though we did not schedule enough time for, for this session of our meeting, unfortunately. Um, uh, Brian Pine, I see, is on our call. Would it be OK? Uh, you could even just do a, a raise hand or a thumbs up if we went just a few extra minutes on this. I see that he on, on video or on, turned his video on. That's a thumbs up. There it is. All right, so we'll, we'll go. Uh, does 820 work, Brian? That's a second thumbs up. So we'll go until 820 for this. And that means I get more questions to ask you all. Uh, so shifting gears a little bit, but what can city government do to support and ultimately house Burlington's houseless residents? That I will start with you, Ben. Yeah, great. Um, so for our neighbors who are houseless, and I think it's important, they, they are our neighbors. I, mean, I consider the folks who are living down in, in Sears Lane to be our neighbors here in Ward 5. Uh, I believe we need more open, transparent, and empathy-driven practices. Um, I know Fareed did a lot of work with the folks who are living down in Sears Lane, and I think that uh, the folks who are living there and our other houseless neighbors around the city deserve a whole lot more uh, empathy as we provide diverse supports for individuals that have differing needs. So again, I think a comprehensive approach is, is necessary to actually achieve housing first uh, for all. Uh, so some ideas are, are for the short term, um, creating and identifying additional uh, emergency housing options based on the state's hotel motel model. Um, but that's not a long-term solution. Um, we need to dedicate more significant resources to the development of more long-term stable housing uh, with appropriate resources. Uh, I think we also need uh, more low barrier or no barrier housing. Uh, and uh, for those shelters that currently exist, we need to provide them with resources to ensure uh, that folks can stay there, that they don't have to leave with their belongings during the day and, re and return in the evening. Uh, I support the creation of a position, full-time position in the city, a housing advocate, uh, to address the houselessness crisis and, and to end homelessness in Burlington uh, in partnership with other community organizations. And look, this is not just a, a Burlington issue like so many issues. This is an issue that's felt in in not our community, but all of our surrounding communities. And to do more, uh, I think we need to work closer with federal, state, and regional partners. I think I saw 
uh, Representative Bloomley on here. I know that she's dedicated to this at the state level, and we need to be working with those partners to do more on the issue. Thank you, Ben. Uh, and for a same question, which is, what can the city government do to support and ultimately house Burlington's houseless residents? Um, I, I think you do begin the question kind of uh, saying this was um, uh, somewhat unrelated to the first question, but I see um, the, the question of public safety and housing uh, actually is to be very interrelated. Um, uh, I, 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 I first um, found out about Sarah's Lane and uh, the homeless encampment um, about a year and a half ago. There were some discussions about how to remove them um, in a humane way. Um, that was happening, but there was not uh, much involvement uh, by uh, the community members, the, the neighbors who were renters, uh, and definitely there was no uh, involvement by the people who are actually living uh, at Sears Lane. And I saw that pattern uh, repeated over and over again. When I first uh, um, learned about Sears Lane, there was four people living there. And over a year and a half, like the city uh, made promises about uh, how uh, they're going to come up with a solution for Sears Lane. Um, but um, the, none of those promises has materialized uh, wh where uh, when the city also closed down all the other encampments, everybody then ended up at Sears Lane. So we went from four um, uh, unhoused individuals living uh, there in July 2020 to what we saw uh, uh, two months ago, where, where there was like almost 2,000 people living there. Um, I do think um, uh, housing is a human right, um, and I, uh, but I, I've heard people in charge also say that, but um, you know, it's hard for me to um, reconcile uh, why, like, if we have so many people in uh, who's making the decision, actually uh, profit off of housing, how can that be a human right? Um, and I'm not sure what the answer is. I do know uh, Boston, uh, new, new mayor recently um, um, took a, a different um, uh, tack with their homeless population. Like they actually started building these tiny homes um, that uh, ended up costing uh, the, the city about six thousand dollars per uh, per individual, and uh, think like how much uh, how much money we actually gave out, for example, to uh, to the police officer, uh, ten thousand dollars each. Like we actually could have housed every uh, homeless person in Burlington for that much money, uh, and probably um, you know save money in the long long term. All right, thank you, Fareed. Uh, our next question is uh, another Ward 5 specific one here, and that is, where do you stand on the conservation of the Barge Canal Superfund site? So Fareed, I will start with you. Um, I'm actually not uh, as familiar uh, with this issues, and I'm still learning uh, about uh, what is involved, but I do know uh, that um, there is um, a concern about the condition of that um, a location with it being a super fun site or being uh, right next to one. I don't think we should be building housing there. Um, you know, like it, it would probably be more affordable, but it's because the quality isn't so good. Uh, I do think it's important to conserve uh, the open spaces that we have. Uh, and, uh, you know, Burlington actually has pretty diverse uh, ecosystems that are uh, going to be uh, really uh, useful to, to all of us um, uh, in preserving. Uh, I do know that there is a, an alternative proposal being uh, worked on by a grassroots um, community organization um, about what to do um, and um, a safe uh, open space um, would be the people I would probably be um, uh, listening to. and. Uh, um, hoping to um, you know to present us with well, what other options we have uh, other than building housing in like in this location. Thank you for it. And Ben, same question, and that is, where do you stand on the conservation of the Barge Canal Superfund site? Yeah, so uh, I, I've become 
pretty familiar with this issue, not nearly as familiar as uh, folks here like uh, Andy Simon and Ruby Perry, who've done uh, great work through the Save Open Space Coalition to put together, I think now over 500 signatures of neighbors uh, who are seeking to conserve that space. Uh, as I mentioned before, I serve on the Parks Commission. They came to the Parks Commission with that petition and, and we invited them to come and, and give a great presentation at our last meeting uh, and, and enjoyed to hear it and enjoyed to hear um, the vision of that group as, as what that space can be. Uh, admittedly, uh, I need to learn more. I mean, I know it's a super fun site and I know that it's a brownfield site and I need to learn more uh, about um, the extent to which any development of that parcel beyond conserving it is, is, is even feasible given the condition of it right now. Uh, I know there's some folks in our community who say that it is. Uh, I do believe that uh, Ward 5 can play a particular role in, in addressing uh, the housing shortage in Burlington. Um, and I do think that there could be targeted amendment of our zoning ordinances to allow for more development of, of certain areas of Ward 5 uh, to allow for the construction of more housing and for uh, the development of more affordable housing. But I don't think we can do that as a, as a blanket approach uh, for all of the South End or, or all of Ward 5 even for that matter. Uh, and I don't think we can really make any progress on um, deciding how, if at all, to amend zoning ordinances until we've really engaged in uh, robust community dialogue on the issue. Uh, we've had multiple meetings um, and, and meetings really where the city comes in with a blank canvas, uh, where we meet with neighbors and, and hear community values uh, and, and take in those community values, uh, including those held by those folks who want to conserve that space before we make any decision as to how any area of Ward 5 should be uh, rezoned or developed for further housing. Showed you my time, but you didn't need it. Uh, all right, so this is our last of our, our regularly scheduled questions. Um, so again, three minutes on it, but uh, we're gonna do one bullet point question after the fact. We'll see what that means when it gets there um, for, for just some quick brief responses. And then you'll have uh, you know just a little bit of time at the end to figure out where, where folks can, can uh, find you after. So the last of our regularly scheduled questions is if elected, how will you balance your own views with that of your constituents and other counselors, particularly when they differ? Uh, so let's see who would be first. Ben would be first on this one. Yeah, so uh, is this a bullet question, Nate? It's supposed to be quick. Full time, full time on this Full time, one. okay, all right, good. Um, so I agree with a comment that Fareed made in the beginning, right? I mean, Burlington is a unique city, more than any place I've ever lived in my life. Uh, Burlington is full of neighbors who want to actively contribute to the future of our communities. And we need to ensure, uh, particularly as city councilors representative, we need to ensure uh, that our neighbors have available avenues to contribute. And, and I agree we need to do better to ensure that uh, everyone has a seat at the table. Uh, so, you know, I would support more robust community engagement processes. I mentioned it in the context of, of housing, but really we should be doing that on all sorts of community issues. Uh, on the Parks Commission, I was proud to play a role in I think some great community engagement processes on uh, Callahan Park and on Perkins Pier, for example. Uh, and those processes through multiple public hearings, through meeting with different constituency groups, changed my initial views uh, as to uh, what was important and what was valued in those parks. So that's specific to those parks, but, but I would bring that same mindset uh, to my role as, as city councilor. Uh, I also think we need to do better about bringing public hearings uh, into the community to hear more voices rather than expecting community members uh, to uh, come to Contours Auditorium or to log on just in the evenings to Zoom if, if we continue here. Um, and, and finally, you know, the city has this great program called the Trusted Community Voices Program. It's a new program that was set up here uh, in the last couple of years or so. And it's built with the intention uh, of working with people who are already uh, trusted voices in different diverse communities around the city. Uh, you know, I, if I was city councilor, I'd love to work uh, with Fareed, for example, on the People's Kitchen, because I know that they uh, are, are a trusted voice in many communities that historically have not had a voice in a lot of city decision making. Uh, so that's how I would balance out my, my own viewpoints. You know, again, I don't enter this with, with political uh, agenda or, or bias on any particular issue. You know, my role is, is to hear all voices, respect all voices, uh, value all of them, 
it's, it's not really about my viewpoints. It's about the community's viewpoints. That, that's the role of a true representative. All right, thank you, Ben. And Fareed, uh, if elected, how will you balance your own views with that of your constituents and other counselors, particularly when they differ? Um, I honestly uh, don't have a good answer to that because um, I, um, I, I do think I do share the, the frustration that most Burlingtonians have with uh, City Hall, uh, especially as um, you know we were facing these uh, challenges the last couple of years. Um, well, I, I feel like the uh, you know the, the City Council, as it stands now, the way it's set up, the the, the form of the uh, uh, the way we make our decisions. Um, there is uh, too much power being um, being concentrated um, in, in uh, too few people. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, first of all, like the, the you know the city council is not going to be representative of Burlington um, because uh, it's a pretty self-selecting group. Like only people who can uh, afford to run will run. Um, even the NPAs, uh, you know, most people, most Burlingtonians don't show up at the NPAs because they can't afford to. Um, so I, I do think um, but, you know, there's a role for elected officials to uh, serve as, um, uh, as a convener uh, of uh, the different uh, voices in our community, the different interests that um, our larger city uh, contains. Uh, and uh, I, I do think uh, Burlington, it, it is time for Burlington to catch up with the rest of Vermont and actually give voters more power um, what, what we should uh, do is update our city charter. There are like several uh, sections there that could use an upgrade. It's uh, that you know it might have worked great uh, for a different time, but as we uh, look forward to the challenges that that, that are ahead of us, we need uh, a, a way for voters to have more input. We need a voters initiative process so that uh, neighborhoods could develop localized uh, organic solutions that uh, can then be um, be presented to the whole uh, electorate. Uh, and uh, we could uh, assign resources um, uh, more democratically uh, through uh, participatory uh, budgeting and other, um, yeah, other, other innovations like that. Um, so that, that would be my answer, it's just to like uh, get more, more people to participate. All right, and thank you both. So that, that's the end of my, my full questions. Uh, so with this time, a minute, a minute both, any kind of last statements that you'd like? I had another question, we'll cut it for time. This is a good one, but you know, cut it for time. So, <laughs> so with that one minute for uh, uh, you know, closing statements where people can find you, any other kind of information that you wanna share. So Fareed, the floor is yours. Um, I hope people will uh, really seriously consider uh, our uh, charter proposals and uh, to support us by uh, side, uh, giving us the, the signatures for our petition. Um, we hope to uh, bring this to the ballot for the November election. And um, if you have more questions, please, uh, you can call my phone, 802-272-8339, uh, or go to the website propositionzero.org and peopleforpoliceaccountability.com. All right, thank you for reading. And Ben, time is yours. Yeah, thanks, Nate. Uh, thanks to everyone who showed up tonight. Thanks again to the Ward 5 NPA for hosting, uh, to CEDO, to Town Meeting TV. Uh, and thank you for reading again uh, for, for the discussion. I'm sure you and I will continue to talk as uh, the days and, and weeks, months move forward. Um, you know, since I've announced my campaign here, uh, I, I've been really lucky to receive some broad support uh, from a number of folks in our community, uh, like Representative Tiff Bloomley, Representative Gabrielle Stebbins, former Representative Mary Sullivan, uh, and, and our city councilors. I, I should take a moment to note, uh, you know, whether, whether you uh, agreed with him or not uh, on every issue, uh, uh, Chip Mason uh, has volunteered uh, a lot of his time and service to our community over the year, years and just want to take a brief opportunity to, uh, to, to thank Chip, again, whether you, you agree with him politically or not, for his service to our community. Um, I hope that you all 
uh, will join in supporting my campaign as well. Uh, you can uh, reach me at uh, Ben Travers, my name on the screen at, at gmail.com. Uh, everyone's given their phone number, so I will too. Uh, you can find me at 802-357-2055 uh, uh, or at uh, bentravers.com. And I look forward to keeping the discussion going. Thank you both for not only joining us tonight, but also for uh, being willing to serve our community. You know, it really is a big ask, not only to, um, you know, potentially serve as a city councilor, but even to just do this process of running. So thank you both for, for keeping things uh, strong and engaged in our community. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that whoever comes out of this in the end on, on March 1st, we will be served well. So thank you both. And with that, let's see, can I unpin you? I will. There's one spotlight removed and another spotlight removed. I just got to remove my own. All right. So with that, uh, we get into our, our final agenda item of the night. It is a uh, also town meeting day focused uh, spot. And we are going to be joined by the director of CEDO, Brian Pine, who will uh, be speaking on uh, some potential changes to the downtown uh, TIF district. But I, I'm seeing a hand raise from, from Carolyn. Yes, Carolyn? Would you kindly uh, at least post everyone's phone numbers? I didn't catch them. Yeah, sure thing. Those will be in our minutes, which are uh, have been taken so well by Lucia for a long time, and she has passed off that duty over to Scott for this month. Those can be found at the uh, CETO website for the NPAs. They uh, typically get posted within about a week of the event. Um, can you put them in? Is there a chat we can do? Unfortunately, there is no chat in this function. Um, okay. Based on just the way this webinar form works. Thank but, you. Uh, they will be in the minute, so be on the lookout for those. And with that, uh, I will pass the mic over to Brian. Thanks a lot, Nate. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I'm Brian Pine. I am the director of the city's community and economic development office since last June. Before that, I was a um, Ward 3 city councilor. And a few years before that, I was at CEDO for um, a little over 18 years. And um, before that, I was a city councilor. <laughs> so if you, if you um, I sometimes have to remember what role I'm in here. But right now, um, I'm hoping that uh, in a few minutes here, I can at least go through some slides and um, give the NPA, you, you have almost 50 people here. So it seems like a pretty good turnout tonight, but provide you with enough information to pique your interest, um, you know, answer questions. Um, and direct you to places where you can get more resources. So the topic tonight, and I'm gonna ask um, for the permission to share my screen because I'm gonna run through some slides. So Sam, I think you're on. I would also ask if Laura Wheelock could be promoted uh, to a panelist. And I want Laura to be here because um, she's uh, my colleague from the Department of Public Works as a engineer who, um, knows this project, um, every aspect of this project. So when I say this project, it's um, often referred to as the Great Streets Project for Main Street. And um, we'll go into the slideshow here um, momentarily. Um, I am going to share my screen. Sometimes I'm a little clumsy at doing this, so bear with me. All right, I think I've got it. Looks like you can see my screen. Do you also see the uh, the video portion of my screen where your all your faces are as well? I can't never can tell if that's there, but I'm going to push that way over to the side. Maybe I can even get it off of there. Um, hide thumbnail. There we go. Uh, so uh, here we are tonight, and I want to start with a basic overview of um, what we're going to cover quickly. Uh, basics on what TIF is. Um, approved TIF projects that are already um, approved for our downtown and um, what, what, what we're proposing to go forward um, on the March ballot, uh, if the city council agrees, and then open this up for some questions. Um, so what we start with is a basic description um, that there are two TIF districts and, and TIF, tax increment financing, is uh, essentially a economic development tool that emerged um, across this country and Vermont has had uh, 
a statute that allows uh, for TIF districts for at least the last two decades. And the idea is that you you finance, you, you cover the cost of public improvements in a designated area of your community, and you make those public investments uh, with the, um, uh, the knowledge of private development that will increase the, the value of the properties uh, within the district. You capture the increase in value only. You don't capture the original tax value. I have a diagram that will go into this a little bit more, but I want to at least start with that basic. You capture the new growth in value that results from the public improvements uh, that are made by the city. You then use those, those, those increased values, the increased taxes coming from the properties within the district to cover the payments to repay the bond that you've incurred to make the initial investment. So it's a little bit circular, but we have a diagram that I think will help in a few minutes. Um, the waterfront TIF was created first in the 1990s, and that runs um, all along the waterfront. Uh, here you see it in uh, kind of a magenta color, and it does have a slice that goes right up uh, that includes the entire um, property that includes uh, Macy's, the former Macy's, the current Burlington High School, uh, the parking garages, the uh, hotels and the Westlake housing that's in there, as well as what um, uh, the city place uh, property and the properties that go right up to uh, Church Street in that area. So that's the waterfront district. This is the downtown TIF district. So this is really um, an important distinction. And the blue hatched areas here um, on the map are the downtown TIF district. So just for background, this district was created by the voters of Burlington in um, March of 2012. However, it was approved as a concept at the Vermont Economic Progress Council, which is the state body that decides and, and uh, makes uh, essentially approves both TIF districts and TIF uh, bonds before they're issued, they, they review them. And so uh, VEPSI will refer to it as the Vermont Economic Progress Council um, allowed or, or enabled our TIF district which started in 2011 with voter approval in 2012. We first incurred some debt uh, in 2016, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. It was a $10 million bond for uh, public improvements in our downtown. Uh, we have until the end of March of next year, so a little over a year from now, and to incur additional TIF debt. After that, we, we don't have any ability to, to basically finance public improvements using this tool. We could go to the voters and seek a tax um, bond increase through regular taxes, but TIF, again, is a way to fund public improvements without using um, additional burden on today's property taxpayers. So it's, it's all about the new increment that results within that district. I know it gets rather uh, wonky, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to give it um, at least enough description for folks. So the final year that we retain education fund increment is 2036. After that, all the tax value goes back to the two taxing authorities, the Ed Fund at the state level to fund the statewide education program and at the city level to fund city services. So um, yeah. that's, the, that's essentially how the model works. So really it's described, I think best here as the difference between the original taxable value at the start of a TIF, TIF district to its current and projected end value. So it's really that delta, it's that difference. That's the increment part of, of the word TIF. Um, most increment um, is from new private sector development within the district. That's where most of the increment comes from. There's additional background growth because properties over time just become um, uh, increasingly more valuable. And that's just a natural trend that happens. Uh, unless, of course, your economy is going the other direction and your property values are going down, but that has not been the experience in Burlington and it's not projected to be. So the original taxable value of our district starting in 2011 when it was created by VEPSI was $170 million. Today's value, same exact properties, is $285 million. So that's a delta of $115 million new value within the district. It's not all of that new value that gets captured to, to um, cover the public improvements. It's 75% of the new value of, of what would have gone to the Ed Fund gets captured, and 25, the remaining 25% goes to Montpelier for the Education Fund. So the original taxes that were generated by all the properties in the district, all of those values, all of those dollars generated by tax property taxes go to the Ed Fund and the city. It's the new value, the new growth, 
75% goes to finance, cover the financing of the bond, the repayment of the bond, and the, the other 25 goes on to Montpelier for the Ed Fund. Uh, all of the municipal portion of the tax increment is captured to retire the bond. So that's that's all of that value. What we've anticipated based on the numbers that we have, excuse me, um, is at the end of our district life of 2036, the new value value of the um, of the whole district is is estimated to be at 375 million, and I can talk a little bit about the assumptions that went into that. Um, so, I am going to keep going. I think there was a diagram there that was helpful. I hope um, these are the projects which have already been approved and have already occurred, have already been paid for uh, with a 10 million dollar bond that the uh, voters approved in 2016. St. Paul Street, Great Streets. So the project that completely rebuilt St. Paul um, from Main Street down to Maple Street, uh, the public improvements, or I should say the public garage at the marketplace uh, underwent significant repairs to bolster the structure there. Um, the Browns Court, former Browns Court parking lot, uh, it had brownfield contamination issues. Those issues were remediated using TIF dollars in order to create um, a development site there and stormwater upgrades on Main Street adjacent to City Hall Park as part of that project. Um, so just to, just to highlight what we're um, proposing here, um, we have from South Union Street, uh, which on this corner is Memorial Auditorium, running uh, west all the way down to Battery Street. So it's the six blocks that we're seeking to, um, to get approval for. However, we already have voter approval for the two blocks right in the middle. So the, the blocks that run from um, Church Street down to, um, uh, from Church to Pine are already approved by the voters. So we're really looking for, we kind of have the, the meat in the sandwich already, but we need the slices of bread on either side, I guess is the, the best way to describe that. Um, so this is what the project looks like, and I won't pretend to be a um, an engineer or a um, you know a designer. So um, if if there are questions about the actual project, Laura is really that person. But overall, the goals listed over here on the right of this slide, rebalancing the use of the right of way, so really from curb to curb, but even going further from building face to building face. So we're looking at everything in that realm, creating a wider sidewalk to make it more pedestrian friendly. Um, handicap accessibility, full accessibility, um, creating a, a tree belt that currently is not there, and, and a dedicated bike lane um, with retaining parking that would be going from diagonal parking to parallel parking. So those are some very specific changes. In addition, um, into creating sort of a more of a community feel and a, and a sense of a place and you know, giving people opportunities for gathering. There's benches, there's, there's bike facilities here. Um, it is a, it is, these improvements are designed to make the public right away a place for, for everyone sort of treated um, in a more kind of, I guess, egalitarian way. In addition, there's stormwater improvements that come from this project that are pretty significant in terms of the stormwater that is generated by all the impervious surface um, currently on Main Street. And that's a big part of this project as well. Um, let's, so I just, we just wanted to highlight some of the existing conditions um, existing conditions are the term used in um, in sort of projects, engineering, and the, the planning and design world. Things in, on Main Street are, um, you know, it's it's not a um, it wouldn't meet anyone's definition, perhaps, of a blighted area in the traditional sense of the word, but it is a very tired um, piece of public infrastructure when you look at the conditions of the of the green belt, uh, um, some of the sidewalks, curbing. Um, you've got some failures at key um, pedestrian points such as the crosswalks and the, the ramps to the crosswalks. Um, you have very significant issues with accessibility in front of storefronts and um, all of these improvements, uh, or I'm sorry, all of these deficits in our infrastructure um, are intended to be, to be addressed. So that's the, the scope of this project. An additional piece of this project, which some of you may have may already know this, but there's a very large ravine that runs um, through Burlington that originates um, really way over near Riverside Avenue and, and runs all the way down to, uh, I think it's ultimately might end up in um, Anglesby Ravine in the South End. Um, you can see on the map here, there's a fuchsia line that runs through um, the Fletcher Free uh, Library uh, behind the fire station. 
and then over to um, uh, the parking lot, through the parking lot at the corner of Main and Winooski, and across Main Street over to what used to be the Hood plant, and then down uh, 230 St. Paul um, Decker Tower, so it goes that way. The idea here is that in order for us to get private sector development on the corner of Maine and Winooski, we need to uh, relocate this sewer line because it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real risk in terms of um, uh, public infrastructure to build a significant sized building, which would be suitable for this location, uh, given that it's the core of our downtown. Um, but there's there's really some you know clear engineering assessment that says that putting a building there with the sewer line um, through the ravine is um, you know is a recipe for real problems. And so the idea here is this project would also entail a relocation of that portion of the um, of the sewer. So the ravine sewer um, would be moved um, is at least the the. The concept here, there's you know some alternatives about relining it potentially, but I don't think that's as realistic. Um, we don't know that yet, so um, more work needs to be done to determine that part of the scope of work. Um, so overall, the project description is streetscape, lighting, stormwater, transportation facilities, as in public transit, um, public seating, um, as well as some as subsurface utility upgrades, reconstructions where necessary, replacements and extensions. Um, you know, addressing issues like water lines and um, fire hydrants and improving the water pressure, um, relocation or possibly upgrading of the ravine sewer for a total project cost of $30,500,000. So we have um, the basic finances that I mentioned uh, earlier is we have uh, already approved $10 million. Um, it says from 2012, but it actually was approved by the voters in 2016. Uh, but that was from the initial 2012 was when the district was approved by the voters. Uh, so we've only we've spent um, uh, remaining to be used towards Main Street is um, four million five hundred and eighty thousand. Um, what we've already spent is the five million four hundred and twenty thousand. So we do have a sizable balance that gets added to the bond question that will go. OK. Okay, I think it may be someone's phone is on um, or something else is going on, but um, a little bit of entertainment there on an otherwise dull topic. But um, so we also have related costs, which I was asked um, to explain these tonight for the Board of Finance. Again, if we could explain, pardon me, what the related costs include. Related costs are everything listed here, and it's also for the life of the district. It's for the entire lifetime of the district. There's annual monitoring and compliance by the Vermont Economic Progress Council. So they, they perform an audit. Um, I'm sorry, the state auditor is performing an audit on the waterfront TIF district. Those types of audits have to be paid for with, with, um, with TIF dollars. And so what's different here though, is we don't include this amount in the amount that we borrow. This, this 1,470 for the life of the district is the cost to manage the program and manage all the projects within the district over the entire life of the district. But it's funded with the annual revenue that comes from the, the incremental growth in the tax value. So rather than borrow the money, because VEPSI has said, we don't want you borrowing money to cover these costs, but you can use actual increments. So it's essentially cash flow from the district. You can use that to cover these expenses. And that's the proposal. It goes to the voters as well. Um, so in a, in a quick summary, the, the Great Streets project, as well as the ravine sewer, is what essentially makes up the scope of this project. We have a new debt request of $25,920,000, of which, um, uh, I'm sorry, and, and there's additional related costs of $1,470,000. Uh, the total over the entire life of the district from the time it was created in 2012 is $1,848,000. And we've projected increment from new private development. It's a very conservative estimates on just just the, what we know of right now as, as development that will um, move forward based on what we know of um, permitting and financing and other, other indicators that show how far along a project is. And this taxes do not increase to repay TIF debt. So when we talk about things like a bond for the high school, they are completely and totally unrelated to each other. And I, I just wanna reiterate that the revenue to, to repay the bond for a TIF district is funded by growth in values only within that district. So it doesn't rely on going to the rest of the city. However, 
we do have to um, disclose as part of this process. FEPSI requires this, and the legislature honestly said this was this good was best practice, and so they're going to require it. We need to tell voters when we're presenting this that we have to pledge the full faith and credit of the city, even though this is not a bond similar to a. a um, a general obligation bond that you issue for something like the high school, it you, you still need to pull, pledge the city's full faith and credit. Otherwise, when you go out to issue the bonds, um, you're going to find very little interest from the bond market in terms of buying those bonds. So that's the project in a summary, and I probably went too long. And time for questions, Nate, do we have time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got some folks here. We might as well take them. Um, so if you would like to ask a question, um, Feel free to use that raise hand function, and I will uh, kind of look through and see if we can uh, get your questions answered. So I see one from Councillor Joan Shannon. So, uh, Councillor Shannon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nate, and thank you, Brian, for the presentation. Can you explain? This is a question my husband asked, and I didn't have a good answer, so I thought I'd ask you. Um, how does the how does general appreciation within the district um, affect the increment? Joan, that's a great question. I think it's one that is often not considered. I referred to it a little bit when I said background growth, and that's really the same thing. So as our district values grow, um, the way TIF is structured in Vermont, as it is in most places, we, we get to include that in the increment. So that is considered increment only within the district. So only for those properties in the district, but yes, that is part of the math. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I see one other hand raised for Almi. So Almi, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure, thanks. I guess I, I have a couple questions, but sprinkled amongst more comments. Um, I've been kind of uncomfortable with TIF as a concept ever since I learned about it. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't really think it's really very genuine to say that taxes don't increase and maybe technically they don't, but that revenue could be used elsewhere. Um, and it seems to me that we're sort of mortgaging our ability to use tax revenues for more serious human needs like housing or education. Um, and, you know, the great street plans, other than the stormwater, which I think is very important for our lake quality, it seems like it's sort of icing on the cake. It sort of strikes me as, oh, it's nice and it's pretty. But I think we have, uh, you know, an incredible tax burden in Burlington. Um, there's too many projects going on all at once with the high school, and we have these we have these unfinished projects of Memorial Auditorium and Moran Plant, and you know our climate change efforts. And there's just so many needs. I just don't agree that you know prettying up the streetscapes should be such a high priority. Um, what if there's another economic downturn, like there was the last two years, especially affecting commercial, then are the values aren't going to go as much, go up as much as you're predicting they will. And then where are we? I'll try and answer that. But I think I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Laura to speak to the fact that the infrastructure on these six blocks is in need of significant new investment, in public infrastructure. So that's a need we need to pay for one way or another. This is a way to pay for it that actually doesn't put the burden on the taxpayers um, of Burlington. So I just want to be clear. The other notion is, is that the, the, the revenue would be there anyway. And that's actually exactly what TIF is, is there to address. It's, it's the but for, but for these public improvements, the increase in revenue, at least in the area surrounding the improvements, would very likely be much lower. Uh, may not occur at all, and it would be certainly much lower. And so new development is is likely to take place at a, at a level that generates new revenue for the um, for both the municipality and the ed fund that fully flows to those taxing authorities at the end of the district. So it's I think it's a uh, I think it's a probably um, something that um, gets a bad rap because in other jurisdictions and other states, there's a different law around how TIF functions. In Vermont, it's very, very narrowly defined what you can use it for. You can use TIF only for public improvements within the public right away. You can't use them for private 
uh, property. You can, you need to also show that you have adequate growth of, of values projected, and it's really those projections have to be really solid. So, Laura, could you just talk about what the project, uh, what the needs of Mainstay are going to be, whether we get TIF or not? Yes, uh, Brian, you've you've hinted to it in other communications about the the last time significant work was really done on Main Street, and uh, it was decades ago. It has a cross section that doesn't necessarily serve. Burlington's current community or the community that it's developing into. And so there's a strong need to be able to rebalance spaces on Main Street that are underutilized for various members of our community and, and, uh, and storefronts. Um, you know, there was a comment about the possible economic downturn. Throughout the last two years, we've used space within the right of way of the downtown to keep our businesses going and to provide spaces for our community members to be outside. That is really one of the fundamentals that this project, you know, that's maybe the icing on the cake is that it provides a harder scape streetscape that can infiltrate stormwater through the whole thing, but it also provides more space that we can use. Um, and again, you know, the, the photos speak for themselves. The condition of Main Street is old and, and the other funding options are a lot more challenging to talk about. All right, and thank you both. I see one other hand raised for Andy Simon. So Andy, you can unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I'm really glad that, Laura, you're standing in front of the St. Paul Street Great Street project because um, actually what I'm really glad about is that the Main Street project includes a bike lane or bike lanes because it was one of the disappointing uh, aspects of the St. Paul Street uh, makeover was this put all of that effort into the in into that uh, stretch of street from from Main Street to Maple Street and then not have a bike lane there. Um, so I'm really glad that Main Street plans include a buffered bike lane in both directions. Um, uh, I guess my my question is about the um, the uh, what do they call it the 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 lot that's next to Memorial Auditorium. Um, um, besides moving the sewer, which obviously needs to get done, um, what what are the contingencies uh, in terms of the streetscape um, that are based on sort of the unknown development that uh, will happen eventually into that? Um, into that that block, you know, the Memorial Auditorium uh, renovation, the whatever gets built in the parking lot and where the motel was. Um, uh, how do you manage that sort of like uh, the, the sort of like shifting possible contingencies in that in that project? That's a good question for Laura, I think, because I think what you're asking is, what if we make these improvements and the uses all start to change? Right. I think, Andy, is that ultimately what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that's one of the helpful things that the city did back in 2016, adopted in 2018, was create the, the Great Streets design standards for this area of the city. And so the design of this project is going to continue over the next year and a half or so. Um, and I anticipate the construction, especially with the ravine sewer of the street level amenities, will be years off. Um, the earliest that construction might start on Main Street would be end of 2023, more likely 2024. Um, and so hopefully by then, after uh, planning with the ravine sewer, there's a little bit more known about Memorial Auditorium. There'll be a little bit more known about what the surface lot um, might have for potential, and then the city could start that effort. But as it relates to rearranging the spaces, you know, the, the fundamental infrastructure is there. You have limited driveway access standards. So, you know, there could be maybe one new opening within this area. And ultimately any development um, that happens in the downtown that disturbs more than 100 feet of curb has to put back their project to the Great Street standards. So there's a, it would be restored uh, if it got disturbed. Thank you both. And I, and I see one other hand raised for uh, from Alana. So kind of looking at the time uh, and, and thank you all for staying, you know, a half hour late. We really appreciate, um, you know, these discussions. 
Um, so with that, uh, I'll pass it to Alana for the last question of the evening. Okay, so thank you very much. I happen to be a big fan of TIF districts um, and just wanted to both recognize that um, not only is that development that would not occur, but the city and the state both get 25% of that new value. It doesn't all go into the TIF district um, that wouldn't be there otherwise. And you know, just from this economic downturn that we've had, we've seen that downtowns have come back much faster and that's because of the higher level of investment and those downtowns support everything throughout the city. You know, we tax our houses, but our houses do not return the same revenue that our downtowns do. So my question is for Main Street, um, for the Great Streets project, I saw that there is a meeting, I think it's next week. And I was curious, is that the same presentation? Is that 100% engineered already? Are you still taking comments on that project or questions, on, I guess, on the design of that project? Yeah, uh, it's a it's a great point to to allow us to speak to our schedule. So unfortunately, with the trying to be able to use this funding source, there is a, a shorter period of time. Um, the concept is not closed. We are starting our concept level conversation with the neighborhoods, the community, the various committees, boards uh, that exist. February first, that is the first community meeting, um, and advertisement for that should start going out this week. We're also going to hold focus meetings with uh, businesses, stakeholders, um, underserved members of our community to ensure that everybody's voice does have the opportunity to make it into this project. Uh, and these conversations are going to continue over the next few months. You know, our, our hope is that we can have a solid concept for how the bike lanes, the sidewalk, the amenities, the art spaces, the stormwater, the parking are all configured on the street uh, in the May timeframe for this year so that we can go to the city council with that. So a long period of time to engage and converse uh, as to how this will be re rearranged. The city is putting forward a proposal to help uh, to move this forward based on our past outreach efforts in the 2016-2017 timeframe from what we heard um, and, and hoping to start restart there. All right. All right. Yep, we hope to be back next month if that's, uh, if there's time. Yeah, I think that uh, we have you in pencil right now on February. So. If you'd like some more information from Lauren from DPW, be sure to join us on, I believe it is, let's see, the third Thursday is, I'm looking at April, <laughs> February 17th. So if you'd like some more information, you can join us then. Um, Brian and Laura, thank you both yeah. for joining us. Do you have anything? If I like could, Nate, yeah, yeah, I have one know. final thing to say, and that is just that um, the comments from Almi really made me, reminded me of one important point, which I think we made, but I just want to make it again. The public improvements are, are for the public good that would otherwise not be possible without this tool. We don't have other sources. So I just want to be clear. People wonder, can't you fund this with all these other sources? Federal government's got all this money they're spending. We, we have lots of other capital needs. We have a new high school need. We have all these other needs. The only way we're going to make this kind of transformation on Main Street is with this. This is the way we're going to do it. It's really not going to happen otherwise. So I just want to be just want to be really clear about that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Any other any other last points? Any other like contacts or? You can go to our website at CEDO. Um, so um, at the city of Burlington, which is um, burlingtonvt.gov and then go to the CEDO homepage and you have to go within the find find the TIF stuff we're going to raise we're going to elevate its uh, profile on our web page but um, you can get lots of stuff there you can get this presentation you can get more of the detail as to all the assumptions that went into it all of this is public information we're going to keep pumping it out there and and raising awareness because um, we think this is the kind of thing that once people learn about um, that they see this as a, as a real thing to advance the public good. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, Great Streets also has its own website, greatstreetsbtv.com. Uh, and it also has links back to CETA's webpage, um, as well as the other information about the Great Streets project and its outreach that's upcoming. And thank you both for joining us. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get those links into our 
notes. Before I have you go, I'm seeing one hand from, from Councillor Shannon. So, uh, Councillor Shannon. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I do strongly support this and that for all my years on the council, you know, we've done several TIF votes. The same issues and concerns are always raised. It is very complicated and it's a little bit hard to both understand and believe, but this is a huge benefit to the city at no cost to the taxpayers. And um, it's, it's a way to kind of leverage improvements in our, in our downtown. Um, and it's always received broad support from all parties. Um, from progressives, Democrats, Republicans, um, and I hope that the voters will support this. Thank you. All right, and with that, thanks, we are- Thanks for your time, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Laura. Thank you to our candidates. Thank you to Sam for holding the fort at 645 Pine. Um, it's been a great resource for us. Thanks to CCTV isn't joining us this month, but they're always a great, great support. Um, and to all of you for joining us. Um, as I mentioned before, our, our next meeting is going to be on February 17th at same time, 7 o'clock. Um, I think I have to mention those. And I'll pass it to Joe. Yeah, sorry. I have to mention the completion of the election results in the meeting, so it goes in the minutes. And it looks like there was 33 votes, and Alana was elected as our... Uh, representative to CDBG. Sorry, Alana. Congrats, Alana. And I know that you will serve us all well. With that, I think that it is- It was close. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. <laughs> yeah, eh, no worries. We'll find another spot. Um, and with that, thank you all for joining us. And we hope to see you next month. Have a good night, everyone.